for creatives to stick together to talk to to again elevate what it is we do to to celebrate what we do and um this is a great platform to do that so thank you for having me i really really enjoyed it feels good to get some of this this these ideas out so yeah well we can as your doctor has told us you know obsessed show <laughs> also is a great therapy for <laughs> for covid and yeah. quarantine welcome to obsessed show a podcast that is designed to inspire featuring some of the most creative people in the world i'm your host josh miles let's talk about today's episode Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with Ben Solomon, Creative Director of Conran Design Group US. Ben has spearheaded full identity development, socialization, and, activa- and activation for top healthcare and wellness brands ranging from AstraZeneca, Roche, and Quest Diagnostics to Merck, Johnson & Johnson, and Havas Mango. In this evolving landscape, he's noted a shift in generic visuals and packaging to more artistic and authentic expressions while still following traditional and corporate sensibilities. Prior to joining Conran, Ben was an ACD with Interbrand Health in New York and an ADD with Interbrand in Shanghai, which I'm really curious to hear more about. Ben and I are going to dig into his story and talk more about branding in the healthcare and wellness space. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Ben Sullivan. Okay, kids, all the way from New York City, and it seems like we have had a lot of New Yorkers here lately. I'm chatting with Ben Solomon. Ben, I'm wondering, should I ask my doctor if Obsessed Show is right for me? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's, it's <laughs> definitely it's a, an extreme condition. So, yeah. <laughs> so there are so many, you know, kind of like tropes and common things that happen in, in this healthcare branding space and in, in advertising. So I, I hope maybe we can dig into some of that and like which ones are things that you just have to do because you have to, and which ones are like, like realtors photos on their business cards. Like they just yeah. think they have to do that. So, yeah. but you know, before we jump in here all the way, like it's, it's mid August, 2020, the most maybe eventful year <laughs> ever for good and bad reasons. Um, how are things in New York right now? How are you hanging in there? Uh, good. I mean, all things considered, um, I think New York as a city and as a, um, you know, just a community has done actually exceptionally well. We got hit hard right in the beginning, but, um, I think for the most part, people took it seriously and, um, in doing so we got used to it. Um, it's starting to open up, which is amazing. There's restaurants are opening up. Um, people are sitting out on the street having dinner and drinks and, uh, the parks are filled, which is great. Um, and it, there's just a life and a spirit in New York. Um, it's also summertime in New York, which is always amazing. And, yeah, right. um, yeah, it, thankfully in the last like month, I would say it started to really feel a bit, maybe because we're all getting used to it, like really used to it, but yeah, uh, right. um, yeah, it's really starting to come back. So, yeah. And so you guys have offices in New York and London, right? Are those only two? Yeah. The London office has been back open for a while. They've kind of managed how people return to work. Um, and they're much larger than us in New York. There's six of us. So, um, the six of us, you know, we have our, our bi- twice a week, we have a full team meetings. We have, we're on zooms and chats, you know, all day long together. Um, and because there's six of us, it's pretty efficient. I think the, the London team's a much larger team. Um, I think there's 75 to hundred people in that office. And so they're, they're, uh, managing how people come back to work. Um, you know, it's staggered times. I think it's very purposeful when people are in the office together and why they're, why, they're, why they're called back to work. Um, New York is, is just, is it, it, some industries are obviously coming back. Um, it's just tough because we're so the people that live in the city and right around it, you know, we're so relying on, uh, public transportation and that, that is just like, it's creepingly openly up, but the ridership's so way down. And so, um, you know, I think it'll be interesting. We're, we're on schedule. Uh, Boston, uh, New York is on schedule to, uh, start opening up. I think there's a couple people at the office now. Um, in October, we're looking to to hopefully start returning to the office on a, a more regular schedule. So, 
And so like subways and buses are, are running at this point. Just oh, yeah. 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 Less dense than they would have been. Yeah. It's just, I mean, you used to like the morning commute, there's no, you used to just smash in up against the <laughs> behind you. And that was, that was typical. Nobody liked it, but that, that's what you did. Uh, I can't, I'm like, I haven't been on a subway in five months. So like, I can't imagine. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. I can't imagine doing that again, but. So you guys are largely remote in New York at this point, And then London's kind of back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm really curious to hear more about, um, again, some of this healthcare stuff. And I'm, I'm really curious to dig into the, the Shanghai portion of your story too, but maybe we could get started with your origin story. Like how did you find yourself into this world? Uh, I, yeah, um, I, I was always kind of artistic as a kid. Um, and I think this is kind of a typical story, but as I got into high school and even college, I, I lost it a little bit. Like I think my interests changed. Um, and, uh, and so I didn't study design or anything in college. Um, but then coming out of college, I, uh, I wound up in media relations and part of my job was to actually design, uh, media guides for, um, athletic teams. And, these were like press kits essentially. Um, and though I had to write it as well, I actually really enjoyed, um, the layout. And so when I was like 23, my boss took a chance on me and I got hired as the publications coordinator down in Washington, DC for the, um, Washington capitals of the NHL. And so I was designing game programs and arena graphics and stuff, um, which was amazing. And then I got to the point where, um, I realized that I really liked doing this, but I didn't understand, um, it wasn't great work. <laughs> like I knew, I knew that it, it was like, <laughs> It was, it was great to have a job and I was excited to work in the NHL. Um, but the, the work I was actually doing was not wonderful. <laughs> and so happened to be that the, uh, that winter, the NHL had a lockout. And so th there wasn't games I still had a job, but I also was like itching to, um, get to New York. And so I applied to grad schools, um, gone into Pratt, went to, through Pratt, then started freelancing. And then um, obviously Pratt was uh, a great experience for me, really had some fundamental, I would say the fundamentals of design, color theory, shape theory, typography, got some um, great education there. And then just from there, just just started working in New York and, and plowing through that. I wound up, um, freelancing for a while then I wound up at Interbrand, um, which I took a full-time job as a designer actually. And, um, and spent, I would say 10 years at Interbrand almost just kind of weaving my way through that network. Um, I believe one of your, does that include your Shanghai time or it was 10 years yeah. in New York? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would listen to your, your interview with Carlos and he, he went through the Omnicom system. And so I was like, Oh, I know that. Like, <laughs> right. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so maybe, um, you and I talked a little bit about this at the top of the show, like what the, what that New York career path looks like for creative, like, and, and part of that, I, it, like, I'm curious about that because I haven't necessarily seen that in smaller markets. You know, I'm in Indianapolis when I worked in the agency world you go from agency to agency and like all the job titles are different. Nobody knows <laughs> what to call yeah. who. And so I'm just curious uh, what that looked like in, in New York for you. I think it's pretty similar. I think for me, I like, I actually took slightly different path because I stayed at Interbrand so long. Um, uh, people are like, are you nuts? But um, it's just, I, I found it exceptionally rewarding and, and found my way through that. Um, I think New York, especially when you're a young designer, um, there's so many places you could wind up beginning that it's good to actually look or like stay fresh and look around. Um, I think when you find a place that works for me, like stay there, but often as a case, you kind of, you know, bounce from one space to the other, you're getting exposed to different, you know, methods of uh, creative exploration or how, how, how teams work together and how 
even even the clients, how clients give you feedback. Um, I think that's it's it's interesting. And so, you know, a young designer might bounce around back and forth, back and forth. You go up the the kind of pay scale, and you also gain titles. Titles in New York too. I'm I'm sure it's around elsewhere, but they don't they don't match up from agency to agency or even industry. So like Conran and Interbrands, obviously branding. Um, when you go Havas, which which we sit under um, at Conran, uh, you know they the as an advertising firm they have a different title structure. So yeah, I, that, wildly like, different. As, I'm sure. Yeah, as you're as you're coming through the system um especially in a large market there's so much you can do with your career and so many facets and and it's 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 awesome to just explore different industries different agencies um uh i i try to tell people that i care about um you know freelancing is a wonderful way to get exposure into spaces if you really, if you can do it and, and build up a client base, um, it's an awesome way to, to design within cities. Um, but if you're actually going to, at some point, kind of make a professional career from it, and <laughs> this is like pitches to uh, designers that I interview that I like, I'm like, it helps to join an agency because then you get a title then you, you start to, you can put that on your resume. You can start to add some of that work into your portfolio. You're working with clients that are, um, well recognized and, uh, uh, it's great to like, you know, latch into an agency for a bit, make it your own, get that experience. And then if you want to go back out and, and bounce your way up the, the scale, but yeah, I've I've shared similar advice as well, just in terms of, you know, I think a lot of maybe more than ever, there are designers coming out of school thinking, well, I'm just going to freelance or I'm just going to be a solo designer. I'm going to start my own thing. Um, and and I think it's also more doable than it's ever been. But it's also you have no idea what you don't know. And the yeah. things that you'll see kind of inside from inside another agency watching on somebody else's dime and somebody else's direction and somebody else's, you know, uh, business development skills yeah. <laughs> to yeah. see kind of how all those things work, I think is, is really a great combination to figure out number one, what are those things I wasn't even aware of? And number two, like, do I even want to run my own <laughs> agency or yeah. my own freelance practice? Yeah. So I, I think that's really good advice. Yeah. I mean, designs, designs a business. Um, it's a hustle. Like, um, when you have, when you're on your own, you are your own business and you're, it's your own hustle. You take the jobs you want, um, especially as you're building up your portfolio, maybe working with clients that um, I'm not exactly thrilled about. I mean, that's all of us, but that happens. Um, but you're also not protected. Um, and so it's, it's a hustle. I did it. Um, and I, I built out the portfolio that, that kind of led me to where I wanted to be at that time. Um, but then once you join an agency and once you, whether it's advertising, branding, packaging, uh, production, whatever it is, you start to get, you get out of your own head, you get out of your own space. And then uh, you start to see how, um, this is partially what I love about design too, but the, 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 the business of it, the, the practicality of it, how meaningful it is to create something for, for, people that you know a, a company that's trying to sell something and to create something for them that is purposeful and uh emotive um and you get that in an agency because you have strategists reading down your back you have the copywriter like <laughs> beating you up like but and you have the motion graphic designer trying to tell you why your idea is not going to work but but it's all it's all amazing feedback and it's all, uh, it just helps you, it just helps you grow. So, um, so it, yes, it, to, to designers that I like coming in for interviews, um, sometimes they just want to be a freelancer. Fine. That's, I, I get it. But I also like, you know, always make, always make my pitch that, um, yeah, get into an agency for a little bit. So did you, um, kind of get into that healthcare swim lane through interbrand and was that something that you were thinking about 
as you were going into the agency or is that something you found while you were there? No, um, that was something I found when I was there. Um, I was brought in as a freelancer, um, kind of noodled my way around for a bit and then got offered a full-time job by the health side of it. And um, the creative director, um, Arjun, who was somebody that he came to my wedding last year, like he's been a mentor and a friend to me um, for a long, long time. He, he was there for 20 years and he was, you know, he's like, so one of these dudes that um, I want to say he was the president of the can healthcare jury. Like he is known, he's smart and he was passionate about design and branding. And um, uh, he hired me, like I said, as a designer um, and uh, kind of grew underneath that. Um, I was there for, I want to say two years, um, got promoted. And then, and that's, that's when I, wanted something else. Um, so I went to, uh, the HR team and I, I said, you know, I want to try something different. And, and that's when I got transferred to China, but the healthcare side of it before going to China, um, what I, people it's cliche and, um, it's easy to beat up healthcare design. Um, rightfully so a lot of it's really not so great, but, um, and I can wax poetically about this a long time, but when you think about, well, we want some of that too. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about the, when you think about what a, a brand is and what, uh, and what a meaningful product is to our lives. Um, it's a shame that healthcare gets such a bad rap under such bad design because what they do, the, the, science behind the products and and um yes they're making money as well but they they literally cure cancers they they help people with migraines like get through the day they help people with asthma uh drop the anxiety of of oncoming attacks that like could literally take your life um and the power and the meaning and the opportunity in healthcare to be authentic about how amazing it is. Some of the work they do, um, is, is missed. And, and so for a young designer, when I got into healthcare, I, um, I was not exactly psyched. <laughs> like I was, I was happy <laughs> to be part of Interbrand and like for my whole spiel working for an agency and having this, this global strength behind me now. Um, but the, uh, what I soon realized was the, um, the real opportunity in this space. It's like, it's like 20 years behind the rest of branding. That's, but, but the stories that could authentically be told emotionally told, not like in the cheesy healthcare way, but really powerfully told, um, and celebrated, uh, I think is an amazing. And so, um, at Conran now, um, we do a lot of, a lot of healthcare, um, a right now it's an industry that's, that's doing very well in, in these COVID times. Um, and it's also, it's so, we're all looking at what our, our health is and, and how it relates to not only the individual, but as a society. And so, the stories that these companies can tell without getting cheesy, <laughs> but the stories that they can tell is, and the opportunity they have is just amazing. So, yeah. So what are maybe, um, you know, I, I think it'd be easy to unpack what's wrong with some healthcare brands, yeah. uh, but maybe like what is, so you could answer that in part if you want, or like what is maybe how Conran looks at healthcare branding differently? Like what are, Maybe yeah. some of the unique points of view that that you guys come at this from. Yeah, I think that um, the leadership of Conrad New York is not a health health care team. Um, uh, came from Wolf Olin's Lippincott. I came from Interbrand Health. Um, they're come from tech, service, leisure industry, um, and this is a team that's been in the last. I, I joined now a year and a half ago. Um, the managing director joined a year ago. 
the team's much more kind of broad in our experience of, of branding. And so we actually um, look at all the cues and how, how, how we would approach a project um, as a typical branding project, you know, dive deep into who the stakeholders are, dive deep into what the customers want. A boss has an, as an advertising agency has an exceptional knowledge base of who or what customers want. And so like sitting inside the advertising agency has helped us tremendously. Um, but really treat it just as a regular um, branding project that, that uh, you know, we would do for a tech company, we would do for a startup. Um, all, all that process and all that, that um, lead in. Typically, I would say um, in healthcare, when you're branding a drug, some of that stuff gets left out right from the start because there's so many deadlines and regulations that you jump through to get a brand accepted. Um, again, having the experience of how to kind of navigate that, uh, those regulations and those hoops. Some projects, you know, their timelines are like packaging projects or sometimes three-year timelines because they have to test um, have to test paper, they have to test quality of ink, they have to test the machines that are gonna do this. All that has to get, goes through regulation and get verified before they can actually start printing boxes. Um, it's amazing, but uh, it's, it's understanding that our clients are often somebody that's, they're like, I don't care <laughs> like what process you get to color. I need to test these colors next week and like um i need and and then then they're going to sit for a year to figure out if they're they're um viable colors they're like i don't want to hear your spiel about what colors mean and stuff but in the background <laughs> conran conran very purposely just as a branding agency very purposely starts just selecting um colors and we can tell stories around those colors um and then when the client comes back and has to tell their boss, why are you guys testing these colors? They have a, they have a real narrative around them. And um, I think it's a subtle shift that the way Conran approaches healthcare um, in, in that space, but it's, it's um, so far it's been very rewarding. Um, we've had some great, great projects in the last year. So it's interesting how those three year timelines can still have these, you know, panicked rush elements to those long, you know, just because the long project cycle doesn't mean there aren't really quick turns within that. Yeah, super quick turns. And and often, um, and I, I don't mean this in a bad way, but clients aren't necessarily thinking about that for your timeline. They're thinking it as in chunks, like I'll get my colors tested, then I'll name it, or maybe, no, maybe I'll get my colors tested, then I'll design a logo, then I'll stick my name to that logo, like and it's all tested independently. Obviously, as a as a branding team, the fact that you're designing logos without a name or picking colors without yeah, that's a name, pretty wild. Kind of tough, but so that uh, that's common practice is that the name comes later in the process. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, um, and that's just that's just the nature of it. As a designer and as a branding team, again, we're like you know, like. But we work around it, um, and as long as we get the the narratives right, and we we get the client on board for what we're trying to do with this logo, it actually then you know let's say the name comes later, then it influences how they're thinking about what their name should be and what it can mm-hmm. be. So we're, we're setting these conversations up early, even if there are super tight gaps, and then like you know some like a, a long time and the name's going through regulatory for six to eight months, whatever it may be we can set these conversations up early. And, and so that there's a confidence that it's kind of twofold, to be honest, there's a confidence that, um, that we can deliver on these markers, like in a week, we can give you a logo whenever it is, but that we actually actually have their interests in heart too, because we're talking about it as one complete project. Um, and, uh, it's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily of that moment, the design that's being delivered is kind of that, that understanding of what this project means, what it could be, um, how these elements all work together. 
um, part of our job is often uh, explaining to clients like, you know, why we wouldn't typically draw a logo before we have a need. Um, but uh, if that's what we need to do, then this is how we're going to do it um, and, and how it will all link back together. Um, and as an agency, then, then, you know, they don't, they don't, some clients, you know, they don't trust you. They just, they're just trying to get you to pick colors. But I think um, at Conran, we've been really good about um, connecting to our clients and what their needs are, and then taking our time to, to tell them how we work. And that gives them a confidence that, that we're behind them. Do you guys have certain uh, things that you look for, red flags for clients? I know you just said, you know, not all clients are going to trust their agency to pick colors. But um, like, what do you guys look for in a, in a good, good fit client in a healthcare space? Um, I think people that, uh, similar to design, I know healthcare clients bounce around because I've, I've seen some multiple clients show up in different, different companies. Um, and so I think that... Uh, it's twofold again. Um, if uh, your client, if your client is just pushing you to pump something out uh, that we may not actually feel fully confident in, then um, I lose a little trust in in that confident in that client because they could very easily just turn around and, and blame it on us. I think that. For the most part, that rarely happens, but it does happen where you get kind of tossed under the bus um, as an agency. Uh, and that's because maybe the brief was wrong or they're not internally aligned or we're just totally not in sync with the client. There's a lot of reasons that could happen, but it, unfortunately, it does happen. And um, kind of keep an eye out for if, if somebody is really just pushing you and doesn't, doesn't want to hear your story, to be honest. But I think for the vast majority of the clients um, we have that I've worked with personally, they're interested in your story because, again, it gives them confidence, not only that we'll see the project through with them, but that we also know from our side uh, what we're talking about. And um, they may not understand the value of it, but we do. And we can, we can help shape that discussions for them and, and their, you know. Everybody's got a boss, so they, they have to sell it up. <laughs> well, no, I'm sure we'll dig more into the healthcare stuff, here, but I, I want to make sure that we don't gloss over this Shanghai bullet point that has just barely been touched on yeah. in this story. So how did how did that opportunity come to be? And what was it like deciding to go to Shanghai? Uh, it was, um, like I said, I was working in healthcare as a younger designer. Now I'm an old man, but a younger designer. Um, uh, and I wanted to do more. So I asked um, the HR team what opportunities existed, specifically a transfer. I had never, I had traveled quite a bit, but I never worked abroad. And um, it was something that I always wanted to do. It's part of the reason why I joined a large agency to begin with. Um, and China for me, I had three opportunities in China for me was is a promotion. I had been in New York now for, I want to say eight years or nine years, somewhere in there. And I, I needed a change. And uh, China was, um, I always had a interest in Eastern culture and um, China specifically. Um, and I was, uh, they were, they gave me a design test, which was actually the only opportunity <laughs> like um, that, that gave me a design test. Um, and I was like, I went so hard for against that test. Like I, I remember I spent like probably three or four days just perfecting it. It was for a Chinese bank. Um, and I just, I just loved it. I dived deep into it. I had a couple of interviews there. Um, they liked me. I didn't speak a lick of Chinese. I didn't, I didn't understand it. I was, um, the only Westerner at the time in the office. Um, and it was just, uh, an amazing opportunity for me and I wasn't ready for a change. And so I took that, um, and I mentioned it to you off camera, but, um, it was, uh, easily one of the most challenging times in my life. 
personally and you're lonely um, professionally because it's tough to find your footing in a totally new market, um, different perspectives on design. Uh, but it was at the end of it, it was the most, one of the most rewarding professional and, and ex personal experiences I ever had. Um, again, I can wax poetically on that too, but uh, it was uh, <laughs> I mean, amazing clients, giant corporations that are trying to come into the China, Chinese market or, you know, South Asia market. Um, uh, Chinese clients going reverse, trying to speak with a global voice. Um, and, and again, design is a business. So tr trying to elevate the, the discussion away from what your PowerPoint is going to look like and really why, why you should think about the colors you're using and what those are communicating back out to your audiences. Um, trying to have that discussion with, um, you know, Chinese CMOs, like it's, it's, uh, it was a challenge and, um, it really, it was just an exceptional experience though. Um, I think that the other side of that is that, um, the way my understanding of the way the Chinese language works and how, how you build meaning and, and the syntax of that, uh, what is valued um, to executives over there, how they see what branding is um, and how, how branding has evolved in China, even in the last five years, whatever it may be. Um, understanding how somebody is, <laughs> for all my BS stories about what color you should pick, it's not resonating and it's not, it's not landing. And, um, and that is, that's an empower, very powerful experience as well, because it's not like a flat out rejection. It's not like, I don't, I don't like purple. It's like, um, I don't even understand what you're trying to tell me, man. Like this, <laughs> this that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yes. It doesn't make any sense. And, and you learn how to, I, I learn, I learned to appreciate how, how, um, varied people's perceptions are how varied uh um design is valued and and what good does what what is considered good design um and it's being in a new york bubble a little bit it's easy to get stuck in um you know what is good design versus uh how somebody else sees that and, and their perception is just as valuable as, as yours. And so taking into consideration all this stuff, um, it is extremely challenging, but again, extremely rewarding. So I, I think we would probably spend a whole, another whole hour just talking about the Shanghai experience, but yeah. you know, I'm, I'm curious about really basic things. Like I would assume most folks over there, spoke some English or if not like really good English. So you're probably communicating in English most of the time. Yeah. I mean, I like, I, by the time I left, I could, if I knew what the conversation was about and, and they spoke slowly in Chinese, I could kind of follow the feedback. And so I could understand how it was being received or, or what questions they had. Um, but for the most part, like my immediate coworkers, my colleagues, uh, many of them spoke English quite well. I mean, um, I had designers on my team that didn't really speak English. So having, giving direction back out to them was sometimes hard. My creative director, um, Fawn, he, uh, he was Chinese by birth, but he grew up a large part in Switzerland. So he spoke, he spoke, uh, <laughs> he spoke, uh, what is it? Swiss, Swiss German a little bit of English and a little bit of Chinese. Like apparently when he got, he came back to China, they wouldn't let him talk in front of clients because his Chinese was so bad. And to, for me to try to communicate with him again, it's, it's just how we communicate. That's the whole, there's a wonderful thing about the design world of how we communicate. Um, uh, it was a challenge clients. A lot of them, the executives don't really didn't speak too much. Um, English, the Chinese clients, I should say. Mm, okay. They're Western clients, they might have a Western, um, you know, 
CMO or, or a marketing lead or something. But for the most part, the executives, the ones that were would eventually buy into this stuff, um, they didn't speak too much English. But like agency operation stuff, like email or your to do list, or it's all part. Chinese. <laughs> yeah, they would uh, email if they needed to. They would email uh, to me in English. So oh, wow. I, I, I mean, I had wonderful people around me. Um, yeah, my, my two best friends were uh, two guys I worked with, two designers, um, native uh, Chinese speakers, and broken English, but we got along. We had dinners. We talk design. We, you know, gave me feedback. I understood it. Like, yeah. So were you studying like the language while you were there or was that just like the immersion of being in it and around it? Yeah, no, uh, both. I had like an um, intensive 10 weeks to get up to speed essentially. Um, but as you can imagine, there's slang. <laughs> like I felt like I was probably learning their grandpa's Chinese. So there's slang. Oh, right. Yeah, there's like, uh, you know, the speed at which um, people people can speak Mandarin is unbelievable. And then there's the, all the the different tones again. So like, if if we're out to lunch and they're talking about soup, like I understand again, like given the context, I understand they're saying soup and not horse or something like that. And oh right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think about that with English often and like all this the words that sound similar and yeah. just even um i did a quick road trip uh last week and kind of went into the the south and you know you hear people talking and like the vowels are different and like just the way we pronounce things even all english like i can yeah. only imagine how difficult that is for non-english native speakers to <laughs> to come over and be like wait you sound nothing like the new yorkers and you sound nothing like the californians and what is amazing, I do have to say, the experiences, especially being a part of the agency, is I went there and I just like I knew the decks, like I saw the decks and I saw the strategy, and it was a um, branded deck. It just happened to be in Mandarin, and I could like go over to my design team and my friends and see them struggling with you know some points in Illustrator. So it's literally it's like the same tool, yeah. same. Uh, same process which i i loved it felt like well, that was incredibly comforting like i mean us as a team we spoke that that it's cheesy we spoke that common language so we understood who we worked for what we were trying to do how we should try to do it how we critique each other like that that was all the same so i really appreciated that <laughs> yeah that's really cool yeah. Um, how did you decide you were done? Like, how did you decide it's time to come back? Um, I had a, actually I had a um, medical experience that brought me back um, to America. And um, my, I have a twin brother. He had a, a family and um, it was time. There's like, again, kind of decisions. There's two paths I could have made there. Um, I could have stayed and been an expat living over there um or at, at this point i felt very passionately about um again branding communications design and i wanted to come home and uh bring what i had learned in china um uh back to uh interbrand and so uh, yeah I, at at some point i i went back to work for interbrand so very cool uh so maybe switching gears a little bit um oh, okay. It was always the same company. Yeah. But what would you say is um, one of your proudest moments as a designer and creative? Um, I would say that the work, I'm just talking about it, two things, like the work I did for um, Huawei in China, which is a, I get it. And maybe maybe rightfully so a bad rap. They're a giant Chinese telecom, um, but the process and it was it started before I got there and it didn't finish before I left. But I had been I was um, coordinating with our chief global creative officer in London. I was working with amazing creatives out of Australia our Australian office out of Singapore, out of Japan, 
I was kind of running point on it. And I was also, um, you know, pushing the design within uh, Shanghai. And so um, I remember, this is kind of nerdy, but I remember at some point, and Ogilvy was working on their campaign at the same time. We were working on the corporate brand. They were working on the, Ogilvy was working on the campaign. Two, two different internal teams from the client working, uh, you know, driving the work. And at some point, the campaign was going to, the campaign was ramping up. Our branding work was ramping up. And somebody in uh, Huawei was like, okay, you guys got to, <laughs> these things have to marry together. You like, can't. <laughs> and so it was like a, it was literally a boardroom negotiation. Um, I presented the design in front of um, Huawei executives and Ogilvy. Um, and uh, they presented their work. Um, and the Huawei executives who, again, don't always speak the best English, um, kind of followed what I was saying. And they told Ogilvy to, to be respectful of what we were doing and, and bring it in. Um, and because, uh, and I remember kind of sitting across this, he was a creative director that did a lot of work, I think for AT&T and Ogil Ogilvy, he was like a, he's a rock star dude. And, um, and me kind of like, I was just like, yeah, like I was like, I effing nailed it. Like I just nailed it. Um, and so that was just a <laughs> That's personal, awesome. personal win. Um, having, having so much kind of, again, leaning into what I believed about the design, telling my story, why it matters. Um, I, I felt so good. It was like a hundred degrees in Southern China. And it's just like, Oh my God, sleep deprived, but uh, just, just loved it. And then I, I think two other things, like I, mean, I, I like doing work for um, smaller, smaller guys. Um, care for the homeless in New York, which is a refresh their logo. Um, they, uh, you know, that's almost is what it is. Like, I don't want to say that side, but like what they do is amazing work. So it's helped. Oh. Yeah. Very cool. They'll work on that. And then um, to be honest, I have a, a younger designer now, um, Annie Yang, who's uh She's been on some YouTube shows for design. She's really just, she's like an up and coming rock star. And she recently um, presented at a, a, you know, Zoom now conference, but she presented, presented at a design conference, Design Nation, it's called. And to have somebody like her, who's a fabulous designer, who's now starting to get the idea of branding, um, to see her. Uh, come up, kind of joke about it, but like I'm a proud dad to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's super cool. Um, well, maybe I guess Annie can be your answer to this if you want, but <laughs> do you have any, uh, I'm especially curious if you have any design heroes as you were kind of coming up in the biz or anybody that you look up to now? Yeah, um, I think that like I definitely always liked um the the classic dudes uh Paul Rand and Milton Glazer like as identity designers I just that got me hooked on the power of the logo and and the, the ability for design to last um and and especially identity design the importance of it lasting and and why that's right so that's those are the kind of classic guys um David Carson I loved um <laughs> still my approach to design just tear it up um <laughs> uh, he's so much passion so much he, he wasn't classically trained he just did it and made amazing stuff transformed the way we think about type and, and composition and I, I he's definitely a hero of mine and then um nowadays like i always like stagmeister and walsh and definitely walsh now and, mm -hmm. um there's a uh, aaron draplin love of his kind of boldness and approach to stuff. And then um, Mitch Payone, who's he's a creative director at this firm called uh, DIA. Um, he's, he's, 
he does I saw Matt brand new actually last year and he does a lot of moving motion type and, and kind of translating natural rhythm and music and and motion into typography he does amazing stuff um yeah the, the kind of a real range of stuff and then like there's a bunch of instagrammers that just do do crazy hilarious stuff <laughs> and it's like um yeah it just I love trolling around Instagram and Behance just to see what people people are just doing crazy stuff. Maybe it's because you're locked in your apartment, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's now we just have time to pay attention to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. so. That's cool. Um, okay. So the question that I have to ask everybody on the show, because we're obsessed show yeah. is what is the thing that you feel like you are most obsessed with right now? And that can be, life or work or design or creativity or, or anything, but what do you find you're most obsessed with right now? Um, so I, I mean, I think, so when COVID started, I got like deep into plagues. So I was like reading about <laughs> plagues and, um, this is a new answer for us. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And so I kind of was like, deep into that for a while. I'm, I, I love history. Like I, if I wasn't a designer, I'd be an archeologist. Like I literally love it. Um, but then, uh, um, but that has, um, my wife gave me a, a book called time travelers guide to medieval England, um, which is essentially a travel book, but written for medieval England. And like, a, the stories are amazing, like just how backwards we were, but there's so much little like design details in there from fashion to uh, tools they use to the materials they use and stuff. And it's just, it's amazing to read. Like there's this, my antidote from this book is like until the 14th century in England, they, people didn't design a shoe for your left foot and your right foot. They were literally the same form. And, oh, wow. And people had foot problems. <laughs> and, and then, Not so much my left foot, but my right foot yeah. it really hurts. So then finally somebody, I, I should look in the book, I, I forget it, but some cobbler was like, <laughs> looked at your feet, like, he's like, maybe we should make things that like work better or fit each other better. And like, <laughs> So that was famous. They invented the buttonhole then, which is again, when you invent the buttonhole, then you can, you don't have to just wear a, a, essentially a bag with a hole on your head, like a cape. You can actually stitch clothes to yourself and, and like it transforms fashion. Like it's just, it's just amazing. So I'm deep, deep into uh, traveling around medieval England right now. <laughs> <laughs> That is really awesome. <laughs> so you've had a chance to work in New York. You work for Interbrand. You've gone to Shanghai. You're deep in healthcare branding. I'm curious if you have any like big dream projects or, you know, other industries or clients that you're really excited to work on someday. Yeah, I think that through Interbrand, I got to touch designing some stuff for National Geographic. They, they have always been one of my like top to uh, things I want to design for. Um, I think now number one would be the Natural History Museum in New York. We just kind of had, because of BLM, um, because of what it means to be an institution kind of founded in colonialism, founded in, you know, whatever we can talk about that as a thing, but I think working for them would be amazing. Um, through Conran right now, we have a lot of exposure through to, um, and this is a particular interest to me, is um, uh, digital therapies. Um, so uh, a bunch of um, smart devices for uh, personal use and also, but then the, the actual digital therapy itself, something that sits between uh, your therapist and the medication you take, this AI learning platforms and stuff. Um, I love I love health and technology together. And so I think um, being at Conran right now, it's really a fascinating time. It's really, really, I'm, I'm excited for those type of projects to keep coming. So 
Yeah. Very cool. Um, so I'm curious what maybe you think is the best piece of advice that you've received in your career, or maybe what's another favorite piece of advice for you to pass along to other young designers or coworkers? Yeah. Um, I'll probably get beat up for saying this, but I had, um, when I was at that media, uh, my very first job in the media company, um, it's actually at Princeton university, but the team there, um, my boss who like would scare me to death with his red pen. Cause he would just, he would old school print out what I wrote and just edit everything. And like, just to the T, he was such a perfectionist and, um, which, which is great, which is how you, is the right way to be. But he once told me that, and I was stressing out about something. He, he once told me, he's like, there's, there's never a graphic design emergency. And, and that got stuck in my head. There's never a graphic design emergency. What we do as designers is, um, and this is also part of working in healthcare. What we do as designers is uh, crucial to how we see the world, how people experience it, how people understand it, the values they build, um, the beauty they see and everything. Uh, but what we, we don't do is we don't cure cancer. We don't... Um, you know, we don't build bridges. Some some structural engineers do and, and designers shape that stuff. But as graphic designers and, and in branding specifically, there's never a graphic design emergency. And um and that little thought for me has like it allows you to be creative, it allows you not to beat yourself up, it allows you to have the space to um try things and, and push concepts and if you really believe it try to sell it um because at the end of the day we're we're about creating um something that's beautiful beautiful but something that's also functional right and and how we get to that answer working as a freelancer working in the agencies being under a different creative director whatever it is all that flows differently um, and the result isn't, it's not written in soul. It's not math. It's, it's, um, it's design. And so there's never a creative, sorry, there's never a graphic design emergency, um, which, which has, has kind of been a, a bit of an ethos, I think in, in my career so far. So, yeah, that's a good, good thought. Um, maybe before we wind down here and let you go, um, do you have any like encouragements or asks of our audience? Uh, I, I, I mean, I think that I, I find it difficult now. Um, can like, it's amazing to connect over zoom. Um, and, and, um, I think you forget, unfortunately, I forget sometimes what it means to be creative because there's so much happening right now in the world and, you may feel isolated um, and uh, but there's just amazing like a troll around the internet uh, i I would have to say in the last two months, the amount of creativity that I've seen coming out is just it's mind blowing like I think that there's you know I just got saw an ad for like uh, uh you know, uh, they're trying to fundraise money for a print bound book of 40 artists that have worked they've created over COVID. And I think that that's, that's unbelievably inspiring to me um, that people, maybe it's just because of, you know, my, my tools now on PowerPoint essentially and some building decks and telling stories, but um, I'm just inspired by what people have done with this time. And it's tough times, but it's like, there's people are just, people are, are, are just, it, it created creativity doesn't stop. It, it keeps going. And, and, um, I would, I would tell everybody to push forward, almost push through this. Cause, um, we're all listening to the show. We're on the show and we believe in design and, and we believe in creativity and, um, and it, 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 this is the time to actually lean into it. Um, and, and really, yeah. Yeah. That's a great encouragement. I think 
it's never been a more, <laughs> at least in our lifetimes, a more stressful time to try to be creative. But I think that's great yeah. advice to lean in and push on. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, like, there's, it's, it's inspiring. Like this, this will change and, and all our projects will get done. There's never a graphic design emergency. So just like be creative, like just, just look for inspiration. Yeah. Well, um, Ben, before we let you go, tell us where we can learn more about you online or track you down or learn more about Conran. Sure. Uh, Conran, um, we're about to relaunch our New York site in a, in a month. So check that out, which is conrandesigngroup.com. Um, my personal site is brsben.com. It's also four years out of date. So. <laughs> All you, all you designers be gentle. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, and I'm on Instagram as well. Same handle. Um, Sounds yeah. good. Well, we will link to all of that goodness in the show notes, as well as uh, all the people and places and things that we referenced during yeah. the show. Um, and I appreciated chatting with you today. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the time. It's great to, as a push for creatives to stick together, to talk, to to again elevate what it is we do to to celebrate what we do and um this is a great platform to do that so thank you for having me i really really enjoyed it feels good to get some of this this these ideas out so yeah well we can as your doctor has told us you know obsessed show <laughs> also is a great therapy for <laughs> for covid and yeah. quarantine uh so thanks for being with us today and thank you for being obsessed with design Okay, kids, that's episode 149 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.